Okay, welcome everybody to our next webinar, How to Build Your Own Home. And we've got a guest with us, Keith Kelsch. Hi, Keith. How are you today? I'm great. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, volume is great. Audio is awesome. Appreciate it. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Keith, you're in, uh, which part of Utah are you in again? I'm in the southwest corner of Utah. Southwest corner. Is that what? close to Arizona? Uh, yeah, the Arizona borders as the crow flies that way about 10 miles. Okay, so you're more of an Arizona guy. You're almost there. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. As a way of an introduction, I'm going to read a little bit of uh, your background, Keith. And I'd love for you to fill in any uh, biographical info just so uh, people can get to know you a little bit better and what it is you do. But uh, Keith, we met you through... Um, some clients of ours that are designing their own home and you're going to be consulting with them on the project. So I uh, really, really lucky to have gotten connected with you. Uh, what I know so far from talking with you is that you've got over 25 years in uh, construction experience, uh, mostly been doing high end luxury custom homes. Um, I know that you've done some multifamily and hospitality projects over the years and specializing in the modern and contemporary homes. Uh, some Mediterranean and uh, mountain living, which a lot of our clients are up in the North Georgia mountain area too. Uh, but I guess you guys got some pretty mountains in Utah, Arizona as well to build with. So, um, but yeah, Keith, we what we know about you is your YouTube channel as well, how to build your own home dot com, and the uh, YouTube uh, videos that you guys have uh, been posting there. So if if anybody listening has not. Uh, watched any of Keith's videos, uh, go to how to, how to build your own home.com. I'll put some links in there too, but he's got some really good, uh, useful inf information on the YouTube channel. Uh, Keith, what did I miss? Anything else you want to tell us about your bio? No, uh, that's about it. Okay. And what do you do for clients uh, today? What, how do people work with you today? Like what's your uh, expertise? Well, my previous life was an educator. I was a college instructor and I, worked in high schools, taught English, philosophy, history, communications, quite a few number of courses. And I was about five years ago, make, I started making posts on Facebook about things to watch out for, things to look for when it comes to managing the build of your own home. And a woman called me up from real local. She was going to move to Oregon and they can't afford a general contractor. They had to do it themselves. Could we talk? I said, sure. I was building homes up in Park City. And one thing led to another, and she asked if I, she could hire me. And I go, well, what will it cost to just, <laughs> just be a consultant? And I go, is 800 bucks okay? And I didn't want to take any money from her. I was more interested in what it would become. And so during the course of helping her out, I started creating a whole curriculum, checklists, draw sheets, budgets, subcontractor agreements, the whole nine yards. And then more clients came on board and I go, I can't consult all these. So I put it on the platform that now has over a hundred videos on it with all kinds of checklists through every process you can imagine. And it constantly gets improved. And then I went to YouTube. Now there's 21,000 subscribers on YouTube. So it's kind of taken a life of its own. <laughs> yeah, there's some really good information there. And and what I like is that uh, everything you're putting out educational is, is about helping homeowners think wisely about this process that can be very daunting. And yeah. uh, there, there's some good content out there. So I'm glad we, we got connected with you. James, how are you? Good morning to you. Good morning, guys. James, um, we're just getting uh, reacquainted with with Keith, but I wanted to uh, bring you into our conversation. And um, I think uh, we had some questions for Keith that we wanted to pose his way. Uh, just like we've done some other webinars in the past, I would love for you guys to ask your own questions or maybe things that we don't get to. Um, but the purpose of these webinars, obviously, is to uh, dive deep, get, get as much info as possible. Uh, myself and James, we want to learn things as well. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear any questions that you guys have along the way. We've got some of our team, Allie and Meg, joining us as well. So you guys are certainly welcome to chime in as you have questions. Um, but James, we got to hear uh, Keith's bio a little bit and his background, but I wanted to jump in and 
talk about uh, one of our first questions that we had for Keith, getting the conversation going. Uh -huh. I think um, I think that's really good. It's it's always interesting to see um, that this consultancy, when it comes to building, is taking off more and more, and clients are reaching out and being like, "Hey, we we realize we need builders involved much early on in the process," um, which is which is great because they are. And there's so many questions around, you know, how do you begin, and like what are the what are the biggest drawbacks of like building on certain sites I, I guess the first question i wanted to ask you um is what what are the main concerns when a, when a client comes to you when you first enlist them what are the major concerns that they have when they when you first start talking um the first thing is is they always ask me can i build this for xyz square foot and i says i don't know uh, it's the hardest thing for owner builders to realize that you really need to come up with some costs first before you even know what the cost is. Now, there's some things you can do in advance, and I have a course on that that helps. It's called the First Steps course, and it basically helps students find out what the real cost per square foot is in your particular market with new homes. And once you kind of know that, you then know the square footage you can approximately pay for or buy. But then until you actually know the real costs for the home you want to build, you have to shell out some costs. You've got to get, you get your architectural renderings done. You've got to get your structural renderings done. And then you need to have your geotechnical done. And if you need a septic, you need a perk test with that and the whole septic system done. You can't get any numbers, any bidding, any estimates at all until you have those things because people need subcontractors, especially those are, that are going to do the shell of the home. They actually need more footage, height of the ceilings, straps, bolts, studs. They need to know exactly what's needed to build this home, and then they can put some numbers to it. And then you'll be surprised that that price point's going to change a little bit based upon the complexity of the design or based upon the actual design, the, the dirt work that may may be a factor that you didn't think about in the advance. And so there's just a lot a lot of research would help. I have a thing called the home site selection checklist. It's free on my website. I've saved a lot of people a lot of headaches by just getting that in front of them first because they too often buy some land without really knowing what's under the land or what the factor is with the land. And they they we, they get seduced because it's a good price. It's a bait and switch situation, and they buy it, and they realize that there's a lot of issues with the land that they didn't think about. That's probably the biggest cost up front. That if somebody can get into them real quick and say, "Okay, here's issues with the land, and here's issues with the design," and if they know those issues to look for in advance, they can be. The rest isn't much of a. It's just. Uh, critical paths and process and stuff like that. But if they really know what they're getting they're getting into with the land and they really know that the design is going to be amenable to the price point they're looking for, then the rest is if they're straightened out and, and, and told to fly fly this way, uh, they're okay. So that's really good. We we want that approach as well. We want fewer surprises going into a project as possible. So um, let's talk about the land for a moment, Keith. Um, you mentioned some things that 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 can be one of the biggest um, costs that that can come up. So you you mentioned some ways to be prepared, but I wanted to dive deeper into that. Um, if you were talking to somebody who's looking at a piece of land um, and they're in the selection process, um, how can they be as best prepared as possible before they even start the design process? What would you recommend they do? Well, there's a thing called due diligence with land, and a lot of landowners really don't know what's incorporated in that land. So when you ask somebody that, hey, I'd like to make an offer on the land, but I'm going to request a geotechnical report. This is not a soils test like for gardening. <laughs> I had a client, I've had several students think the soils test is a geotechnical report. It's not. 
soil test is the top six inches of soil. We're talking 20 feet below, and that's geotechnical. Geotechnical will come in and do a core sample, and they will typically do it, go down or a test pit, whichever the geologist will recommend for that particular area. I like a test pit that's 12 feet down. But if you've got expandable and collapsible soils or other issues, they'll want to do a core sample and they'll drill down 20, 30 feet. And then they'll pull out some core samples, put them in a bucket, and they'll do a proctor on that, that test, that soil. It will tell you what it is. I live in the Bermuda Triangle of bad soil. So it's a bit, big issue I promote on my channel that you, you should never build without that geotechnical report. Now, your structural engineer, they're going to require that that's going to tell them what the footing structure is going to be in the rebar structure in the home. So you really can't have that. And then plus, if you're going to put a septic in, that same geotechnical person, typically for the most part, they can also do a perk test that tells you if the soil percolates, if water can percolate and how they can design that septic and whatnot. If you can get that geotechnical report from the seller in advance and not buy in the blind, they should. This is what I don't understand about sellers of land. They really think their land's great. And you go buy, go get that done. And then add it to the price. We've got this ready to go and whatnot. And I see a lot of uh, owner builders buy property in a subdivision. And they say they've got the geotechnical report. But that geotechnical report is not privy to that particular lot. It could be if you're lucky. Most of the time, those geotech reports are scattered throughout the subdivision and it might be a sample here or a sample there but it may have nothing to do with your land at all and your land your lot could have been the last one built on i built on a lot many years ago and uh i didn't think what i was doing and as we started to dig two three feet down we found five feet of grass clippings and just <laughs> just below all there and so the back corner of the house had to be over excavated cleaned out all that garbage had to be, be removed. That cost me about 4,000 bucks back in the day. So that's what I'm talking about is really knowing what's under what's underground and what yeah. that world is like, so. Yeah, absolutely. What What is it, um, we, we have a, obviously we, we do a lot of designs up in North Georgia in the hills and in the mountains. If you're bringing in dirt, how do you price it out or what's the best way to kind of think of the site and be like if you do run into hey we've dug down and there's a big this huge boulder we need to get rid of or there are all those grass clippings how do you deal with it at that point you got to bring dirt in you have to bring in certain compactable dirt or the or the top layer of the dirt might not be compactable buildable dirt how do you then what what do you who do you approach to then sort that issue out that's typically the excavator but excavators are kind of fly-by-night operators sometimes. So they may bid out just the, the work to move the dirt, maybe recompact it. But if you need clean fill, they won't factor that in because it may need more than what you need. So it's a good example. I was building a home about nine years ago with a client. And I was there on site when they did the core samples, when they did the test pits. And I asked him to do one more test pit on the far corner of the house. We ran into solid rock. And so I saw that in advance and I was able to ask him to give a test pit, one more test pit. So when the budget came in, it came in at 26,000 for the excavation. I put in a budget of 48,000. We ended up spending 36. Oh, wow. Well. And so when it comes to that, I'm overly cautious, which throws my numbers up a little bit, but I'd rather upset my clients at the beginning, but never at the end. You don't want to come up to your clients and say, I'm sorry, but we need to put a second and a third mortgage on your home. You, you don't want yeah, to. that conversation usually doesn't go very well. No. I haven't had to have that yet, but um, so, but yeah, we, we, we say like uh, measure twice, cut once, same, yeah. same idea. Right. That's the same with, with geology. It's such a factor. I've seen excavation bids I just had one come in a week ago, $109,000. Most people would never think that that before you even start building your home, oh, man, excavation is going to be something like that. And if if you have the money, fine. If you not, if you don't, you want to try to avoid that that home site. So, And I would imagine prices with the inflation that's happened during COVID and stuff like that, the prices have probably skyrocketed just on excavation and earthworks and stuff like that, just like everything else. 
Yeah, especially diesel. Diesel fuel is the most expensive form of energy right now. And you can burn through tanks and tanks of that. And your operators between 45 and 85 bucks an hour. If you're if you're digging into some nice just alluvial soil and it's a clay soil and there's no rock in it, great. Even if it's a hilly thing, it's not a bad thing. The minute you start getting into an aggregate and you get into solid rock pan, at a home we were putting a pool in, we dug down, and it was just solid um, Navajo sandstone, red sandstone, just solid. I go, we could spend under the ten thousand dollars trying to dig this out. Or if you let me, let me do it in an infinity pool and we stick the pool up a foot and a half out of the ground. And they like that. We solved the problem. But if they actually said no, we want it all in the ground, then that's a huge cost. So knowing what, if you can be there with a, with a tractor and they do the test pits and you can see the strata of the soil, if you can see that in advance when you're there, it's really going to help you out. And as a builder, I'm never at a job site where I don't see that, either at the core sample or the test bill. I want to get in there and climb down there and see what it's like. So I'm a geologist at first, and then I'm a builder. <laughs> well, that's yeah. really that's really helpful, though. I mean, I, I'm the kind of person I get excited about every project I talk about. So every, every piece of property I've gone out with uh, the people who've joined us today, I'm, I'm the dreamer. And I, I will love, love to uh, come up with the ideas for these homes, but um, I don't want people to get freaked out either by what you're saying, Keith. I want, um, I do think it's really important. Um, you know, I use that as an example of when you get that excitement, um, you find that piece of land, it does feel like the perfect fit, uh, not to let that excitement carry you away so that uh, right. we're actually taking our time and slowing down. So James, I think that's a good lead into the next question I, I wanted you to, um, talk to Keith about um, that we had coming up, and then I see a question. We'll get to that in a moment here. Down there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So once once we're we're out of the ground, we're building. We have, maybe we have the concrete slab down at that point or crawl space. What would you say are the major pitfalls? Like once we're past that excavation layer and we're actually building the home itself, what are the major pitfalls to look out for? Um. I was thinking um, it's kind of backtracking a little bit into yeah. geology. It's, it's the plot plan and the topographical layout of the home. If, if like James goes to the job site, he sees it visually, the layout of the land, he can properly place that home on the land. But I've seen a lot of people, architects, I'm dealing with a build where the architect has never seen the land. He took the topo from an old geology survey it wasn't accurate. I had to readjust every foot the home and all. So if he's there, he visualizes it. He can actually see where those topo lines are. And if there's a survey that does some topo, topographical elevation changes on there, then it's going to help James quite a bit. And he can visualize exactly where to put that home. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, it, it does. Um... If we go further on it, the type of construction as well, because um, yeah. not every site is identical, obviously. So some yeah. of them will be concrete slabs, some of them will be a crawl space, some are going to have a basement. Sometimes we recommend, hey, your slope is so big, it'd be a good chance to put a basement in, whether you finish right. it now or whether you finish it later. Um, when it comes to thinking about those sorts of things, what's what's the top of the list there that we should be considering? If this if the site is large enough, if you're at least over half acre, you can typically manage all the soil on site, not have to remove it. But if you're in a subdivision where it's a smaller lot and you're putting in a basement, you're going to have to haul all that waste off. And that's going to increase your cost substantially. So the larger the lot, the better. Typically, you can manage all that soil right on site and you can use it for your final grade. It's good to know. Um, I want to get to Gamu's question. Uh, this is a good conversation, too. And then I know we got some other questions for you, Keith. But, Gamu, if you'd like to unmute um, and chime in. Hi, yeah. Gamu. How are you? So, I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us again. Good, good. So my question is, uh, what are the different considerations when you are picking uh, land uh, close to a water water body? Is there any special Bot conditions that need to be done? A near body of water, Keith, uh, creek, lake, um, pond, even lagoon. 
What, yeah. what kind of things do you want to think about when you're looking at a waterway on your property? Most geologists, when they do a core sample or when they do a test bit, they will say at what point they reach water. And you would want to do that uh, on a, if it's a, been a dry spell for a month or so and no rain, then that water table is going to be dropped. But if it's a rainy season, that water table is going to be high. And so you, you have to know where, what time of the season you're doing that test pit. Luckily, if you do it right after a rain or right after the springtime, the springtime is the best time to do test pits because typically the water table is a little higher. You don't want that pond coming into the home. There are some ways to ameliorate that. If that's the case, then we're talking French drains, we're talking rock on the outside of the foundation, we're talking treating the foundation with a, with a treatment. So if the water does come up against it, it's going to drain down straight and it's going to go into a trough system and it's going to get away from the home. So you know, trying to find out how high that water table is going to be your trick. In, an open pit would be more amenable. They can't get down deeper than 14, 15 feet. And so typically home is not going to be any deeper than that. I'm a big fan of backhoes. Just take a backhoe on the side, dig down, find out how deep it is and see what the moisture content of the soil is. And you can see that just by visually looking at it right away. Awesome. Thank you. Does that, does that help them? Did you have a uh, follow up? Yes. Yeah, definitely. That's good. Thank you. Great. Um, I saw a couple of people join us a little bit later after we got started. Uh, Travis, hi. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to meeting you. Um, and Dana, um, I saw you join us too. I um, enjoyed getting to meet with you and Dre last week. But uh, if you guys have any questions, um, we're, we're approaching that Q&A time. So a good way to do it is just to raise your hand. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can uh, type a note into the chat box and I'll be happy to read that question out loud. Um, so as I'm as we're continuing the conversation, we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit before seven. So we still got some some time, but just want to invite everybody to contribute, uh, ask questions for Keith if you'd like. Um, but Keith, you you kind of touched on the budget um, a little bit uh, ago as we were starting the conversation. Um, and it's a very common question uh, we get as a design firm um, is, is the budget. It's, it's a big, um, it can be a very stressful conversation, uh, but it's important because um, we really want to do something that is buildable. We want to design something that's going to actually get built. So having a realistic budget is very important. And um, we're trying to answer that question for people about what can be done uh, constantly, as you know, it's a moving target and there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, but as you're thinking about your construction budget, what are some things, Keith, that would be helpful for our clients to be thinking about on the front end? And I also want to tag on to that. Um, what are some ways that people can make their investment go a little farther? So things to think about as you're investing your money on your construction budget, what should we be thinking about? But also, how do we think about making that construction budget last as long as possible, getting a really good return on the investment? It's a, kind of a two-part question. And Travis, I do see your question. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I always try to get students to shrink what they want as much as they can. Yeah. They think that because they're going to save on the builder fee, which is like, anywhere from 75 to $250,000 and up, if they can shrink that, what happens is they start to add, well, I saved on that so I can add this and I can add that. And that's that's kind of a mistake. And I always tell students, don't line item to zero. Every bid that comes in, every estimate that comes in, don't, add, don't put the exact bid in. You should know better that you should round up, round up 100 bucks, round up 50 bucks, if you, if you know. You have to create padding in a budget. This is the most realistic thing that I could ever teach you is that you don't save at the at the budget phase, you save during the process of the build. So let's say for example, that imagine you're a builder and you're gonna put in a builder fee and you're gonna put in some extra contingency, banks are gonna ask anywhere from seven to 10%. Even if you're an owner building, you're a cash builder, you should have a 10% contingency over the total cost of the build. And then go ahead and put the builder fee in there just for the heck of it, because that's what the realistic price per square foot is going to be. Now, when you're building your home, guess what you've got? 
you've got padding galore. And then you can decide what you want to save and what you want to not what you want to include during the course of the build, meaning you can save during the course of the build, meaning when you're done and you're under budget, you say, yeah, I built this home for do for this price and I saved X, Y, Z because you put the real cost up front. And you don't necessarily have to put a builder fee in, but I would strongly recommend at least a 10% contingency over the total price and then additional 3% contingency on lumber costs an additional 3% contingency or a point and a half contingency on framing costs, extra 3% contingency on excavation, and maybe an extra contingency on concrete. Those are the four big ones. And if you have extra contingency or padding for unforeseen things, like every build I have, there's an unforeseen thing, especially the custom home. If I'm a, a builder grade cookie cutter situation, it's a flat lot, I'm pretty much streamlined on my costs. But when I'm dealing with homes on elevations and it's a custom home, it's a new comb home, I, I push for these additional contingencies. It's not for my benefit. This is for my clients. I'm gonna be finishing up, I finished up a home three weeks ago and I was $30,000 under budget. I'm finishing up another home and I, he just found out He's a little sneaky bastard. He found out that I'm under budget $46,000. He wants to spend it. <laughs> so now we're adding all this extra landscaping and stuff. I was going to give him a surprise, but I have another home that I'm finishing up that I'll be about $18,000 under budget. Um, but I'm deliberately making myself that way because they owe me $14,000 because I, I bought a piece of land they needed from a neighbor to put a septic system in. And so I'll get I'll get re paid back from that, but I, I I can do that. And you want to be under budget at the end of the build, and the only way to do that is to have contingency and at least a ten percent over the entire build. That sounds like a little overkill, but let me tell you, if you put a line item to zero on every line item, every budget and estimate that comes in, the exact amount, you're going to be over budget substantially at the end of the build. So you have to plan for that in advance. This is our custom home builders and you have to think and you have to think like a custom home builder not like a production builder don't even try to compete with a production builder you are a custom home builder and this is how custom home builders think luxury builders think like oh what's a what's a 50 percent contingency <laughs> i had a, a job yeah. I last year that was i budgeted it at 1.8 million ended up being 2.4 because they kept adding and adding and adding and they had the money for it which is, which is fine but think in terms of a custom builder yeah well and, and we're the same way we we don't we're not pushing for our clients to build a certain square footage we're not pushing for them to build a uh a certain construction budget that's you know we don't benefit from a higher budget or a lower budget or a bigger house or a smaller house uh, we just want the home built. That's the that's the main thing. So approaching it from that mentality and going into it with what's realistic and what to look for. That's that's the whole reason we're having this conversation right now is so that people listening can uh, be more empowered and more educated and understand more of what to look for, so that it does end up benefiting them on the cost side over time. Um, so that's that's really wise. I really appreciate that, Keith. Um, I did have a question that came in through the chat window from Travis. I wanted to get to um and he's asking about geotechnical reports so um keith you can answer this too but we do have some local uh contacts and uh, james uh you you might want to uh, chime in on this as well um michael i see your hand we'll we'll get to your question here in a moment but travis uh from what i uh, understand about your project i believe you're in jake's landing up in ella J, if i'm not mistaken um is that right travis yep that's okay. right Cool. So we're we're designing another home up in that same neighborhood, um, and I believe this is the one that's got a 1,200 square foot um, requirement for the new construction out up there. So there's some covenants, uh, but we know that area. Ali um, could probably introduce you to some geotech people that we've got contacts with. But uh, Keith, um, James, I'd love for y'all to chime in on, you know, why do we need a? G we kind of talked a little bit about. Why do we need a geotechnical report? But up in, in Travis's situation, Ella J, the mountains, Jake's Landing, 
um, what does that conversation look like when we're building on uh, kind of a mountainous area for geotechnical reporting? James, maybe you could take a first stab at it since you know the area. Yeah, sure. And I think um, Casey touched on it before. If, you, if you're looking at who you can reach out to to talk to, um, I'm presuming that you're going to be on a septic tank. If you are on septic, that is probably the first place you could go to as well because a lot of these companies are combined. Like they do a lot of different, um, a lot of different services all wrapped up in one. If you're doing septic, you can often talk to the septic team and they will do the geo um, report for you at the same time. And that's probably more cost effective to get it done by one team as opposed to going. Say that again. I said it's had a perk test done on it already, so I didn't know if that's the same thing or if it's slightly different. It's the same thing. Same it's thing. Actually, perk test is for the septic. The geotech is for the structural. Okay. Yeah. So you can have a conversation um, with them and see if there's any difference in that um, from their point of view and get them to follow up. If, they, if there is a difference, if they don't do it, then it's... Um, matter of talking to a few other people as well but it's just calling around really and, and that's um precisely why we have ali as well she can help big time with finding people that can help us do these sorts of things yeah so ali um will we'll, travis will connect with you uh, i know we're planning on getting together soon but between me and ali um, we'll get you guys some names of uh, some people, and um, I'll, I'll mention that to our client who is building in that particular neighborhood. We might have a uh, point of contact we can refer to you as well. Um, Keith, did you want to add anything to the question about the geotechnical report, typical cost, or um, what to think about? Yeah, the, uh, the bigger the lot, the easier it is to accommodate, but if you're buying a small lot, the, the geotech um, that's going to do the septic, they're gonna actually want a plot plan before they can actually put the septic system on the plot plan. That's where James comes into play. They're gonna actually need his design work in some situations, not always. In some situations, they're gonna to need to know that what's the footprint of the home and the, based upon that, we can put that in. Here, two pieces of advice when it comes to that. I just, I'm putting a septic in on a home and uh, it wasn't fitting and I thought there's something wrong with this. This, this septic is oversized. And I went back to the plan and found out that they were counting a pottery room without a closet as a bedroom. And I said, this is not a bedroom. This is a, a pottery room. Well, it could be converted into a bedroom. So I quickly changed the design on the plot plan and I marked it off as a storage room for a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they, they said, okay, okay, we'll take it off. That shrunk my septic by... 30 feet, you know, quite a bit. It now fit on the plot plan. And you have to play games with health departments like this because yeah. in the base septics, most areas do on the number of bedrooms, not the number of bathrooms. So if you're putting in a lot of bedrooms in there, it's going to size up that septic enormously. But you can rename those bedrooms something funky. <laughs> and it can't be anything that can look like or become like a, a bedroom. I have another build I'm doing a septic on and they fought me on this and I says, okay, we're going we're gonna to take out that wall and we're just going to put a pool room. It's a, a playroom. And I didn't have a partition wall uh, that uh, that showcased that one end of it could be a bedroom. And they said, okay, we can reduce the size of the septic. So these are, I could talk forever about this, but just work with James on that and the design and the footprint and ask the health department, do you based upon the bedrooms or bathrooms? Most of the times it's bedrooms. That's going to tell you, hey, I may want to relabel something or change it into a mudroom or something. The yeah. labeling is going to be a big factor on that size of that septic. So, yeah, it, it but, happens all the time. And we had, we're going through it on one design at the moment. And he had uh, two bedrooms in the basement and he had to just basically rename them. And that solved the problem for you. Each county, each city is going to be slightly different. Some of them won't care as much as others. So, yeah, yeah you, having the conversation. And sometimes if the conversation doesn't come up until you have to submit it. So and it's just a matter of amending and resubmitting. That's good. Thank you. I'd like to get to Michael's 
question and uh, Dana, I saw uh, your question come in on the chat, so we'll get to that one next. Michael, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, of course I have a million questions, but I'll try to limit it just to a couple <laughs> that I feel are, are yeah. where, where my knowledge base is really lacking. Um, so once you once you start the construction, I know there's this process of like you set up funds and then the builder draws from those funds and everything, I guess, to buy materials and those types of things. Um, so, for example, when the house is, is already under construction and there have been a few draws off of the funding, and let's say it the, that, that structure burns down or whatever, who, like, is the builder um, has insurance to replace those materials that were destroyed? Or is that something that's got to come out of my pocket? Or do I need to get some sort of insurance? How, how, how does all that work? If you have a builder, the builder like myself would have a 2 or $3 million policy, a replacement policy. But since you're the builder, you would need to get that coverage for yourself. And just talk to a good insurance person, uh, umbrella policy, uh, a builder policy, uh, something that's for 12 months or 14 months, however long you need. And that is factored into the budget of the home. And you put a line item, here's what my insurance is going to cost. Some jurisdictions may ask for a bond. And the bond is their insurance that the home will be built. It won't be an eyesore. It will be finished, meaning it's specifically tailored or, or ticketed for that build, meaning if something happened or what have you, then that bond kicks in and it will finish the project. So, Well, well Keith, I, I'm... I'm actually planning to have a builder. Okay. Um, so that's where I'm trying to delineate where 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 does the where does my responsibility end and the builder start and all that, or let's say, heaven forbid, you know, the builder you know goes belly up or whatever, and um, I've paid for all these materials that are sitting here. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out where you know how does all that work. Look at their track records, see what their testimonies are like, how great they are, what's their typical completion time, are they typically under budget or over budget, these are things you should ask them. And also get a copy of their insurance policy, then have your own insurance agent look at that policy, make sure there's proper coverage. Typically, if you're licensed in any state, it has a requirement on the coverage you're supposed to have. And most builders have that basic coverage. And find out from your state uh what that requirement is and then see if his insurance policy meets up with that state requirement okay. typically you're building a home in around yeah and just just Go one ahead. final question about like the draws all right so let's say they're going to um want to purchase the lumber all right so do they do they draw the money before they actually even place the purchase order for that lumber or do they draw the money once that lumber is delivered to my property well, the way I work with a lot of banks and I look with private lenders, I don't ask for anything up front unless my subcontractor asks for that up front. And most of my subcontractors don't ask for anything up front because they, they have a lot of trust with me. I'm usually net 30, so I'll pay them within 30 days. And uh, if they ask for that, that's fine. 50% uh, up for the lumber cost right up front and the other one that's delivered. Most banks are going to have, well, not all of them, if they're sophisticated, they're going to send somebody out there before they issue the check and take pictures to see is the lumber there, are the materials there, is it 60% completed, is it 70% completed, and they have systems that tells them this, so now we can issue the money rather than just is issuing it in the blind and not seeing that things are not getting done. So there's a, there's a way to measure that where you feel comfortable okay yeah I've, i'm about 40 percent done i can i can issue him this money i like to break it out framing costs typically three or four different draws not all at once concrete two to three different draws like today i'm issuing a, a check for ten thousand dollars for my flood concrete subcontractor his bid was twenty one thousand and i said let me just give you 50 percent if you don't get a draw in now you're not going to get a draw in for another two weeks he goes oh i could use some money because he just did some major work on the house right now. So I don't want him to wait another two weeks. So I have that communication with him. If they see that you're concerned that, that they should get paid at least for work that's done, he says, give me a 25% draw, I'll put it in in the next draw, and I only give draws twice a month. 
first and the second, the first and the fifteenth. If they come to you and say, "I need money right now," so then you you tell them, "I only do draws before the first and before the fifteenth, so you have to get it in before then if you want it on that draw. Otherwise, they're going to have to wait another two weeks." And you're just you, you okay. communicate right. that to them and you let them know in advance before. All right. Thank you. Keith. Yeah, it gives good. me a little more comfort. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's there's a lot of complexities going on, Michael. And like you said, there's probably a million questions. Fortunately, we have an ongoing dialogue together, so um, we'll continue to talk. And we've got um, Kenneth Johnson partnering with you guys on your project as well. So we've got some good people uh, helping you out along the way. But um, thank you, Michael. That, that I hope that helps. Um, I want to get to Dana. Uh, Dan, if you would like to ask this question, you can, if you have any follow-ups, so I'm going to go ahead and read your uh, question in the chat. And thanks for being here today. Um, but Dana's asking about uh, a situation in which the homeowner would be their own general contractor. So uh, if the homeowner is their own general contractor, how does that person know and ensure that the house is going to be built to code? Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, James or Keith, whichever one of y'all would like to Talk about that. Somebody who's, who's trying to build their own home as a general contractor, how do they ensure that they're under code? I'll let you go first. You can let me get this done. Um, well, from a drawing's point of view, we draw a two code, right? So it's worth having a look at the drawings. If there's any questions about the drawings, if, um, if it's during construction, it's kind of a, a point where you would stop have some like an inflection point so you come back to us and you'd be like hey we just need some more details around this make sure that we we're building it the way that we want to you know and this happens all the time i have a meeting tomorrow morning with um the contractor just about the stairs and about how they want the um the cladding on the outside of the building to be done so it is better just to stop and quickly ask the question and get on a meeting with the you know with your framers or whoever that's involved in that with the design team and just be like hey here's what we're trying to do how do we need to make it work and then and then proceed once you're satisfied with it once you understand the problem um it's better to do that than to build something see it doesn't work and then come back um drawings don't always match a life situation right so there are variables there that once you start building, you're like, hey, this actually doesn't work as well as it should on the drawings. So that's that's the example of like, hey, just stop and ask the question and then come back. We've had examples in the past where the beam might hit a wall six inches off to the side. Um, we didn't line up exactly how it was on the drawings and it was the framers who read the dimensions wrong, but they came back and said, hey, if we had stopped and just been like, the dimensions they're not lining up with where the beam are and that if they had asked the design team we could put it together and make sure that it did line up before they built it so you know try and avoid problems before they begin so when it comes to code there's certain things that you need to adhere to the drawings should match up with the code if there are any questions about it stop ask the question and then come back um keith anything you want to add to that yeah, there was a question that came up. We can answer that question at the same time is engineered plans. A lot of counties don't ask for that. Mm -hmm. That's 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 very dangerous. You can't assume that a framer is going to be able to frame a home to the right engineered plans or to the right engineering without those plans. That's how you hold them accountable. And then you don't release funds until it passes a certain inspection. Like on my framer, I'll hold back three to four grand at the very end, even though he's done, until I pass my final inspection. You want to keep him on the hook for just a little bit. That way you say, hey, I, I need a, a support beam, a cross beam, I need supports, I'm missing some J bolts, I'm missing some Titans, I, it can be missing something. I said, I need, and I'll give him the list, and I'll send him the re inspection. He'll, he'll do that, he'll come back and do it. Once I pass inspection, then I'll release the whole amount of money. So that inspector, if you've got a good one, they'll catch things for you and they'll help out for you. If not uh, additional checklists, which is what I've been working on with my program, I have checklists on plumbing and framing and excavation and all that, where they can actually look at that and, and see, okay, it looks like I'm missing this. And you can ask your subcontractor about that and then get it done, get it done right. And then, of course, you can issue them the money once it passes inspection. So, yeah. And, and we all, and 
we include engineering every single time for that very reason. So um, it, it does help with the building permit process, but it's it's certainly we we want to see a well built home at the end of the process more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Dana, that was a great question. Did you want to um, ask any follow ups or uh, chime in at all? If not, it's okay. But you have the opportunity if you'd like. Um, got a couple of questions. Oh, Dana, yes, hi. Oh no, I was just saying I didn't have any follow ups. <laughs> Okay, great. That was an awesome question. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm very excited about uh, y'all's project out in Covington. They have uh, about 10 acres out there, beautiful piece of property near a creek. So we're excited about working with you guys. Um, Travis, I see a couple questions from you. I want to touch on John's question. John, hope you're doing well. Good to see you again. Um, septic systems, we talked about this a little bit. Um, maybe this is a uh, similar to what we covered a moment ago, but are septic systems oversized in such a way that you can relabel the room with no repercussions? We kind of covered that, but is there any clarity I wanted to add to that question about septic systems and the uh, relabeling of rooms um, to keep your requirements down? Um, it's, yeah. I was gonna say, it just depends on how many people you're gonna have in the house. If you relabel the room, um so you can have a small septic um, system and then you introduce 10 more people into the house and they're using the septic system you're going to have issues right even if that's like a holiday season it's just keeping your head about you and, and being appropriate to the system they're trying to protect you in the long run and make sure that there's no blockages in the system and then any water that does come out of the system into your backyard doesn't cause any issues um so it's that sort of consideration that you need to think about so there's been instances I know with my own family on a septic system where you have everyone home for the holidays and it backs up the system, right? Because it's only made for so many people in the house to use. So, so there are repercussions at some point. There's at some point, depending on what you do, and I'm not going to judge you for what you do in your own house. But yes, there are there are that sort of repercussions to think about. Yeah. Keith, yeah. did you want to add? Yeah, just a real quick thought on septic systems. It depends on what that perk rate is of the perk, perk test. If, like, I'm on a job right now and it rained three days ago and there's still a puddle of water on the north side of the house, that's a big sign for me. If you had a septic system there, we'd have some problem because the reason why it backs up is not because you don't have room in the tank. What happens is you've got a tank like this and then the waste comes in drops in the tank and then the rest of the, the rest of the water goes out into the leach field okay the waste doesn't go out into the wheat or leach field it drops in the, into a tank if that leach field is not draining water through the soil strata fast enough that's what could cause it to back up and so if yeah. you can get your perk test and there's shallow systems and there's deep systems they put shallow systems in specifically because it doesn't percolate fast enough and the deep system yeah are are designed because they can quickly fast that's really good that's really good thoughts thank you i hope that helps john um we'll certainly have some conversations as we get a, a little further along but uh, john did, did that answer your question i hope that helped and um travis i uh, had two questions i want to get to those I appreciate this uh, is it a good idea to bring a grading contract out to the property before deciding to build the site? Uh, in a brief answer, I'd say yes, but um, I want to get into the second question Travis asked, that you guys can speak to both of these. So is it a good idea to bring a grading contractor out to the property before deciding to, the, to build? And uh, do the counties typically require engineering? Uh, we talked a little bit about that, but I, I think there could be some clarity on uh, both of those. Uh, so bringing out a grading contractor before deciding to build and do counties typically require engineering um, and and just side note uh, travis i know that your project i believe that's gilmer county um, and so we can we can talk about that a little bit with the engineering um yeah james or keith what do you think about a grading contractor yeah i would i would get them out there as quick as possible don't let them make a bid without them seeing the site. And uh, they are gonna need that geotech report before they even make a bid. 
if they're making giving you numbers without the geotech report and without seeing the site then you've got a problem especially if you got a lot of aggregate or boulders and a lot of greenery shrubbery trees typically when you're doing a geology excavation you can't leave anything larger than the pinky of your finger organic matter in the the site it has to be all excavated out come on in come on cody so that that's what's the key is not any organic matter in there and i know the one site jack we looked at they have a lot of trees <laughs> on their on their yeah. building and so the, they're going to have to literally excavate all that out and eliminate all the root systems that are in there so there's nothing bigger than a pinky inside the soil yeah we we typically as a design firm mm -hmm. um i'll do a site visit um i'll include james as much as possible with some videos and pictures mm -hmm. um we'll typically bring in our landscape designer daniel gallius mm -hmm. to do a site visit and um kenneth is one of the guys that we do a lot of pre-construction consulting with so he'll usually do a site visit um, as well um but yeah james as far as uh okay. engineering. The, the engineering yeah yes. that might be a good chance for you to chime in and, so uh, not every county is requiring it and there's certain things that may trigger engineering to be required and it's not always structural sometimes it is like civil engineering as well no. so yeah for the counties they're getting stricter and stricter so it's best to be safe and just presume that your county or your city will require it. If you're a city, they typically do. If you're down, say, in Atlanta, Sandy Springs, Brookhaven, anywhere that's closer into Atlanta, yes, absolutely, you're going to require it. Um, now, if you're further out and you said Gilmer County, I'm not sure we would have to just double check because they all they all differ slightly um, on their requirements. So it's becoming stricter and stricter now when it comes to the size of the home, um, the bigger the home, the more likely you're going to have to require engineering from a county point of view. If the home was um, so big that you would take up 5,000 square feet or more of lot coverage, um, the answer is yes, right? And that may take the form of a civil engineer or a landscape architect or designer or your surveyor coming back in and making sure that you have a stormwater management plan so that's taking how the house sits on the land, how you're going to deal with the water runoff around the home because the water can no longer be absorbed into the soil. So there's things to consider there. But as a general rule of thumb, we include engineering in all of our projects just because even if a county doesn't require it, it's really good to get the coverage of an engineer on there. They take liability for you know some of the structure that's going on and that can be built into what the framers do what um all the other services that come with the site and it, and it touches on what dana is asking about code too uh, when mm -hmm. we include engineering uh, we can ensure that those documents that are being produced have gone through the rigors of being tested and uh and reviewed and stamped so we it's it's an accountability to us as a design team it's an accountability to the builder and an accountability to the engineer um, so that that's exactly why we do it Travis, I hope that answered your questions too, um, and we can certainly continue to talk. We're about at that time. Um, Keith, I, I did mute you just for a minute, so you might want to unmute when you're when you're ready. <laughs> but um, um, but yeah, are there any other questions? Anybody else have uh, anything else they want to chime in on, or are we still got a, a few minutes for anybody wants to to ask before we wrap up? Otherwise, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm certainly available for follow-up questions. Keith, um, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, we mentioned your website, howtobuildyourownhome.com, but um, yeah, how, how can people connect with you, follow you? Where would you like them to um, stay connected? Oh, and you're, you're on mute, by the way. There we go. Uh, there you go. Thanks. You can go to howtobuildyourownhome.com. Follow the YouTube channel under the same name, or they can go to my professional site, which is Kelsch Construction, K E L S C H, KelschConstruction.com. But uh, how to build your own home, that's the best way to get the home site selection checklist. It's free, it's on the home page, it's at the very top. Get that for free. I should send that to Jack and just have him put it on his website. He says, hey, get this first <laughs> before you buy land. 
Um, but then, yeah, we, I, your, your checklist is actually very helpful. I downloaded it myself. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll share that on our site um, and link to you as well. But um, yeah, y'all, we would encourage if you um, want to learn more from Keith, the, the YouTube channel is awesome. The checklist and a lot of the stuff that you've done is extremely helpful. So Keith, thank you for giving us your time today. It uh, means a lot that, that you uh, did that. Um, but before we go, uh, yes. So, sorry, I thought I was interrupting. Uh, James, thanks for getting up early to, to join Keith and I on the webinar. Uh, assuming we don't have any other questions, um, I'd love to hear from you guys. I'm looking forward to meeting some of you guys in person real soon. Um, and thank you for making time during your evening. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, y'all. Thank All right, y'all. Have you. a great evening. Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.